life. I'd like to start the presentation today with a bona fide miracle, a sign that Jesus Christ is alive and well and that he cares about our well-being. As reported worldwide earlier this month, a 21-year-old mother-to-be from Henderson, Kentucky, saw what she feels is a sign from God. Now, I'll show you the image. You can tell me if you see the sign. You see it? <laughs> this was taken, an ultrasound, on the 11th of April, 2016. Of course, here is the miracle. Yes, this is Jesus Christ on the cross. That's right, Jesus apparently decided to ignore the other 20,000 infant deaths that will take place in the year 2016, instead deciding to manifest his own crucifixion on one woman's ultrasound in Henderson, Kentucky. This is not the only time, by the way, that Jesus tapped us on the shoulder here in 2016. This story reported by Fox 5 News in Washington, D.C. about a February 25th tornado in Evergreen, Virginia that did major damage but left these standing three crosses. And in fact, an enthusiastic Twitter user named Faithful had to say this. They had to say, it amazes me in the midst of a tornado, these three crosses continue to stay rooted. Hashtag to God be the glory. Now this tornado killed seven people. Seven. Who almost certainly were crying out for help probably, possibly, from God, who died in terror and whose lives were tragically cut short and whose loved ones are left to cope with unspeakable grief and loss because God apparently thought this was a greater demonstration of his power than saving the lives of his own children. It's curious also that these crosses had concrete footings and gave very little wind resistance. I just wanted to throw that out just in case you hadn't seen it. I went on Twitter and commented after the story and said this. I said the headline should read, God allows tornado, ignores endangered children, rescues dead wood, opts out out of cleanup efforts. <laughs> I produced a video recently called The Bible in the Fire, and it's on YouTube for anyone who wants to see it, but the short version is this. It's the story of a guy whose Jeep was clipped by another vehicle on Highway 385 in Tennessee. The car caught on fire. Thanks to bystanders who rescued him, he was pulled out of the burning wreckage right before it exploded. He had only minor injuries. What made this story go viral on the internet was this, the revelation that a Bible inside the car had not been destroyed. In fact, this is how the headlines read all across the United States. Bible withstands flames from Memphis car fire. And of course, God was praised for giving us such an undeniable sign of his saving power. There was someone on YouTube or Facebook, rather, who said this. They said, it goes to prove that there's power in prayer and trust in God. To all you non-believers out there, watch this video of the car fire and see the power of God in prayer. Now, personally, I, like you, think this. I think if Jesus really did exist and he was watching all of this, right? He would say, it makes no sense. God didn't prevent the accident. He remained undetectable as people risked their own safety to help other people. The laws of physics clearly at work. The driver in the car were doused with water, by the way. The Bible was closed up, making its inner pages much harder to burn. Other papers survived. Why weren't they mentioned in the miracle? The driver taken to a hospital with injuries. He didn't survive unscathed. And of course, one has to ask why God would stave a $10 Bible while still sticking this poor guy and or his insurance company with the medical bills and the cost of replacing an entire SUV. Why hundreds of other Christians, God-fearing believers, die in horrible car fires every year. They don't survive. Why a few pieces of paper are divinely rescued in a world loaded with actual human suffering. It's like this meme that was on the internet. I'm so glad God didn't burn your Bible. This pretty much for me sums it up. Is this really proof of the power of God in prayer? I come from a devout Christian faith. I mean, a hardcore fundamentalist Christian faith. The Bible's true, absolutely. Jesus is real, absolutely. We were not Sunday Christians. We were all in, 100%, all in. I knew without a doubt 
that there was a God, and that his name was Jesus and Yahweh, and, and just plain God. I had no doubts the Bible was true. I knew it was true. Even before I really had read it, I knew it was true. And I might have actually believed in my youth the story about the car fire in the Bible. I might have taken that to heart and said, it's a miracle, it's a sign. Today, I believe I was speaking and acting a contradiction. And it's a contradiction that I would like to explore today. And if you are a believer in God who eventually sees this presentation on the internet, I would like you to hang with me even through the more difficult parts of this conversation because I'm going to end in a destination that you may not expect, okay? So give me the benefit of the doubt even if you are skeptical. Somebody recently sent me a link to a Facebook page called Stop Cancer, Start Praying. Specifically, there was a meme posted on that page which said this, Heavenly Father, may every cancer cell be cast out and replaced with a good one. May every spot of this deadly cell be wiped out by your powerful hands. Amen. This leads me to the words of Scripture in Matthew 21, 22. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Mark 11 tells us, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. John 14 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. This is one of the many reasons that we finish our prayers with, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God hears and answers prayers. They stand upon this promise, as did I when I was a true blue believer, based in God's word. God hears us. God answers our prayers. Worldwide ministries are built on this concept. Churches, pastors, teachers, apologists, they encourage us to exercise our faith like a muscle, building it to become stronger every day and rooting that faith in the power of Prayer. In the United States, many believers, especially in the Christian church, observe a national day of prayer, inviting all people to pray for our nation and its leaders. And Americans get together, Christian Americans get together in front of courthouses and churches and flagpoles and mosques and synagogues and temples and street corners and whatever to pray for the USA. Here's the slogan for this year. Wake up, America. Encouraging all to wake up and refocus on God through the power of prayer. The president of our country hosts a national prayer breakfast. This was taken in February of last year at the Washington Hilton. Prayer is embraced and extolled at the highest levels, okay? On an individual level as well, many of us have found ourselves in our lives in the darkest moments, in our darkest hours, and we've dropped to our knees and we cried out through the power of prayer for help. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Psalm chapter 54, verse 4. The Bible says Jesus healed the sick throughout the New Testament. God is greater than illness, malady, misfortune. Certainly God's greater and more powerful than cancer. The commenter on the Stop Cancer, Start Praying page pleaded, Dear God, we pray to you, our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, for a cure for this dreadful disease. Now look closely at this impassioned plea for help. We pray to you, our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name for a cure. A prayer ask in Jesus' name for the help of his children and the glory of the Father. A prayer like countless other prayers offered up through history. This prayer follows Jesus' rules, right? And yet, over 8 million will die this year from cancer. Many of them believers crying out and praying for healing. And I'd wager most of us know people desperately prayed for, for divine healing, standing on the promises of God, and they were not healed. In many cases, the prayers offered up in the midst of chemotherapy or some other cancer treatment provided by human hands, not divine ones, human hands, leading us sometimes to speak in confusing and contradictory ways, like this enthusiastic Facebook user who said this, God does heal cancer. My wife had stage four ovarian samocarcinoma with prayer and faith and chemo treatments for a year and a half. <laughs> she is 100% cancer free. When you're living a contradiction, this makes sense. 
It's not a contradiction. Here's another one that was just sent to me by a, a thinking atheist a radio listener. Well, it only took 18 days and numerous calls between the provider Blue Cross and the specialty pharmacy, but we finally got approval for John's chemo medication. They're delivering it tomorrow. Thank you, Jesus. Here's a Florida billboard that declares faith is greater than cancer as it advertises the hospital that you should check into for the physical treatment of cancer. And of course, their website lists the various types of physicians you can pay to physically treat conditions that are supposedly miraculously supernaturally cured by faith and prayer. Prayer, it works. And we put our trust in prayer. And if that's the case, why is the chemo necessary in the first place? At great personal expense and with great duress upon an already afflicted body? With the hair loss and the bleeding problems, the extreme fatigue, the swelling, the infection, the nausea, the vomiting, anemia, organ damage, etc. And this treatment solution was not whispered in our ears from on high. The message on its surface appears to be that prayer heals, but sometimes God's healing power arrives in disguise. The miracle wears the mask of invasive surgery, expensive pharmaceutical drugs, months, even years in a hospital, under the dutiful watch of human caregivers. In fact, even the most attentive observer may not be able to tell the difference between the intervention that is human and that which is divine. Many then declare that it's human hands that are divine, divinely appointed to demonstrate Jesus' goodness ourselves here on earth. We played a song by a group called White Heart when I was in Christian radio in the 90s. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are his people. Believers are agents of goodwill. We are extensions of Jesus' love here in the physical world. We are to act as the hands and feet of Jesus, like this internet meme that says, don't ask God to guide your footsteps if you're not willing to move your feet. Right? If you want God to move, you've got to make sure that you also are in motion. For him to work, you must work as well. He's the foreman, we are the laborers. Here's a firefighter doing the work in this internet meme while Jesus helps to lift the fire hose and a genius in the comments section said, hey guys, the fire is the other way. <laughs> We look and see the inroads humankind has made in the treatment of cancer bears no resemblance, none, no resemblance of divine intervention. We struck out, we did, as human explorers, and at great cost financially and in terms of human casualties, we ourselves wrestled the answers from the stingy claws of this hugely complex and often mysterious threat to this cancer. It's not like we didn't care. It's not like we weren't praying or working. It's not like God's people haven't had or exercised their faith. Yet the whole of human existence has yet, to date, has yet to demonstrate in any provable way that a single cancerous cell has been supernaturally cast out ever. And if you have proof of this, please tell us because the world is waiting desperately for a cure. Jesus' whole story is one of supernatural healing in a natural world. as when he cast out the demons of the possessed man at Capernaum, or when he healed the leper in Galilee, or when he cured the blind man at Bethsaida. He cured the woman's issue of blood in Luke chapter 8. He even injected life into dead human tissue when he raised Lazarus from the dead, as he promised to his people in Mark. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. But knowing that God is good, and in light of God's declaration, he answers prayer, we explain to ourselves and others, Hey, our formula for answer prayer might be a pithy, wrong-headed human idea. Maybe that's the problem. We're interpreting it wrong. We're doing it wrong. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than than your thoughts. God works beyond the narrow scope of human perception. The Lord works in mysterious ways. When I was a Christian, I was surrounded by these bumper sticker platitudes of surrender. You know, I'm not supposed to know. I'm not supposed to comprehend. 
and I was comfortable living that contradiction. We see these posters and memes out there on the internet, these vacuous messages. You know, I found a few on social media. God has a reason for allowing things to happen. We may never understand his wisdom, but we simply have to trust his will. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Faith is trusting God even when you don't understand his plan. Here's one that says, when God is silent, he is moving. That's right, the more undetectable God is, the more we know he is working. Don't mistake God's patience. For his absence. His timing is perfect and his presence is constant. He's always with you. Say amen if you trust in God's timing. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. <laughs> Anybody else have to endure this stuff on your social media pages? This kind of language reduces us to idiot poets, does it not? God speaks when he is silent. God moves when he is still. God helps when we help ourselves. God is everywhere, but you might not see him anywhere. God can do everything, but might not do anything. God defeated sickness. Get well soon. God bless. At the very least, at this point, as a prayer warrior, we have to add an asterisk to the promise that God hears and answers prayers, right? All right, God hears and answers prayers, not necessarily at the moment we pray. It might be on a delayed fuse. Not necessarily in the way we expect. It might arrive in a different form. Not necessarily in a way that can be verified as God's work, right? It might be disguised as the hand of a surgeon, the prescription handed out by a pharmacist, the natural workings of the body's own self-healing mechanisms, another earthly agent of intervention, or just plain old dumb luck. And it might not even happen in our earthly lifetime. It might not even happen before we die. We've constructed a scoring system, have we not? With multiple and constantly moving goalposts, conveniently creating game day scenarios where almost any and every possible outcome is a score. It's a positive. We win. High five. And in the name of our personal God or gods, we claim victory. Years ago, I presented the hypothetical story of Stephen. I uh, did it in a speech called Blind Spots. Let me show you the example quickly if you haven't seen it. Stephen is walking home one day, and a car drives up, and a gang opens fire on him, okay? Neighbors call 911. Stephen rushed to the hospital as his family watches in horror, praying to God Stephen is going to live through the night. The prayers continue in the waiting room as the surgeons do their work in the operating room. Now, let's explore one of three scenarios. Scenario one, Stephen will fully recover. It was a graze, it was a flesh wound, non-critical injuries. It's a miracle that he escaped with his life and health. He should have been really injured and instead he totally walked away. God is good and he hears our prayers. Scenario two, Stephen partially recovers. He lives, but he sustains permanent injury, brain damage from a bullet to the head, or he's paralyzed after a bullet to the spine. He's alive, but his body's broken. The family praises Jesus. Right? With so many bullets flying, he should be dead. The fact that he's alive and still with us in any form is proof of God's goodness. God is good, and he hears our prayers. Or so scenario three, Stephen dies on the operating table or at the scene. The family is devastated. But they continue to stand firm on the power of prayer. God called Stephen away. From this brief and temporary life, God called him home. God allowed this crisis to strengthen our faith. This is but a light and momentary affliction, as referenced in 2 Corinthians 4. And this will achieve for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Stephen is now in a place of supreme happiness where there's no suffering or pain, where they shall all be reunited one day. The whole family will see Stephen again in just a few moments of time in relation to eternity. God is good and he hears our prayers. In every case, with any outcome, God remains the hero. The happy ending that changes with each version of the story. 
I mean, there's no scenario where any of these people look up, and I was one of these people myself. You look up and you say, hey, why did God allow the guns to even fire in the first place? God's like silly putty, is he not? He's mold him to whatever you want. Perhaps we're molding our ideas of God to fit various outcomes, and our whole lives reveal a contradiction. Does it make sense to stand upon God's promise of divine protection, good health, and a long life? The prosperity doctrine people are huge on this. I would wager most of them have health insurance policies. Why would someone claiming God's divine protection ever need a health insurance policy? If Jesus really takes the wheel, why would you ever need to click a seatbelt? The master, of the, the one who created the cosmos, the one who is the most powerful creature beyond imagination has your back, and still you need the airbag and the seatbelt. If you're driving a vehicle, that doesn't make much sense. Why would you ever put a security system in your home? Right? It's like the lightning rods on churches. <laughs> it betrays a pretty alarming lack of faith, does it not? Why would you ever own a firearm? I'm from the Bible Belt. Guns are ubiquitous in the Bible Belt. It's a contradiction. These people are claiming divine protection, right? They say, well, God can do anything and he has our back, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. I mean, yeah, he cares, he protects, he saves. Right? I believe in the power of God, but it doesn't hurt to believe in the power of the Glock. God protects, but he doesn't. God heals, but he doesn't. Well, sometimes he does, but not all the time. Maybe he's doing something else. Leave it in God's hands, which sometimes look like our hands. God speaks, but he's silent. God moves, but he's still. He's unmistakable, but he works in mysterious ways. God wants to, but he can't or he won't. He works today, but he's waiting. God's all we need, except for the other stuff we also need. God, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hello, hello, hello? If we decide not to move the goalposts, if we give ourselves permission to expect the God who's not the author of confusion to not be confusing, and if we examine the nature and the merits of protecting, healing, prayer at face value before we celebrate its power, some very difficult questions remain, and I think they're questions that we need to be asking. Whether we're at the peak or in the valley, at our best or worst of moments, the question still stands and it deserves an answer. Is it true? Does it work? Does it make sense? This is a young girl with leukemia. Now, God sees all, past, present, and future, correct? Nothing is hidden in creation from God's sight. God knows everything. In that context, he saw the cancer cells in the child's body before they ever formed, before the child was ever born, before any child was ever born. Before the creation of the earth, God saw these lethal cells and their deadly outcome. God saw it coming, and he did not prevent this. God did not speak into the girl's ear or her parents' ears to warn about the cancer, no tap on the shoulder, no heads up from on high that this was coming. Instead, the girl starts to experience fever, pain, chills, infection, weight loss, bleeding, agony down to her bones. It's a physician, a human being, that has to discover and deliver the news. A treatment plan begins, almost always at huge emotional and financial expense, devastating and bankrupting many families who resort to asking friend and stranger alike for donations for help. Give to our fundraising page, attend our church charity event, donate extra at the offering plate, pledge via this phone number or website. Please help us pay for all of this somehow. God allows this to happen despite the fact that God ultimately owns everything and could immediately remove at least the financial portion of this burden. The Bible tells us in Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Everything belongs to God anyway. This is why when you tithe in church, they don't say that you're giving to God. They say you are bringing or returning to the storehouse. What is God's, right? Bring all the tithes to the storehouse. You're essentially returning to God's. What was God's anyway? Because God owns everything. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit of the trees belongs to the Lord. Philippians 4.19 says God will supply your every need according to his glorious riches. He's rich. God is loaded. 
Yet manna does not fall from heaven, and serious financial consequences loom over the believers and non-believers alike as they commit every resource to win this fight against cancer. Many people lose everything. They lose everything. Oddly, God the healer doesn't supernaturally intervene in a definitive way as the doctors and medical staff work in earnest, and the chemotherapy poisons the very young body it's working to help. Prayers continue weekly, daily, hourly, minute by minute. The family, desperate not to lose this precious, innocent life, petitions God for help, for healing, for solutions, for the answer, for the promise given in the Bible. The instant miracle does not occur, but instead God is given credit for the incremental successes of treatment administered in his absence by trained human physicians. If this child improves, praise Jesus, the Lord is so good. If her condition worsens or if she dies, God is thanked anyway. The Lord works in mysterious ways. The goalposts are perpetually in motion in the celebration of life or in the shadow of death. And for doing nothing, nothing that we can detect in any way, God gets the glory. I wonder how we'd fare in our own jobs, my friends. You know, if we never showed up, if our work looked just like the work of everybody else, if we never communicated audibly, measurably, if we went in for our 90-day evaluation, expecting the highest of praise, right? At the very least, we'd be put on probation, would we not? And yet God remains the hero in all circumstances. There's an interesting website called Why Won't God Heal Amputees? It raises a great question, right? Why have God's healing miracles, these miracles that we see talked about by all the prophets and the praise healers and whatnot, why, why have they only manifested themselves in ways that are conveniently vague? God grows you a new arm or leg. Hey, now we're talking, right? That's a healing miracle that would rally the world together and bring glory to the Father. But what form does this miracle take in the whole of human history? I like to call this slide, Shit Humans Invented. A limited visual chronicle of prosthetic technology developed by decidedly human hands. We got tired of waiting for God, so we got to work once again, and we created the solution that God did not. Some of us see it as nonsensical that credit for this would be given to anyone besides the inventors and the investors. And for this, we're called what? Callous, cold, arrogant, evil. After all, the brain that thought these things up, that was designed by God. And again, another goalpost is moved out for the score. I'm reminded of this story reported just a few days ago in the Fresno Bee about a two-year-old born deaf and blind, diagnosed with pediatric glaucoma. She couldn't even see light. Thanks to science, surgery, $17,000 raised to pay for the surgery. Little Nicolie Pereira can see for the first time. Physicians drained water that had built up around the inner ear, allowing her to hear for the first time. Of course, her mother was eager to give praise and credit. She said the only word that can be used to describe the feeling is God. I didn't see one word of thanks in this article to the experts who solved the problem. She may have said the words, they may be in another article somewhere, in another interview somewhere, in another forum or platform somewhere. But in this news report, not one word of thanks to the people who cut the child open and fixed the problem. And this is often the case. But we have to examine the charge that this all-powerful God hears our prayers. God knows the cure. He holds the global cure for cancer. He knows it. There's nothing he doesn't know. He's got the solution. He does not use it. God knows the individual cure for cancer, disease, AIDS, whatever. He does not use it. 
Or if he does, he cleverly disguises it as a human construct. How much sense does prayer make in light of God's will? His will is unmovable, unchangeable, a foregone conclusion. His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing can stop God's plan for your life. So how much sense does prayer make in the context of God's will? If it's unmovable, unchangeable, a foregone conclusion, his will is done. Here on earth as it is in heaven, what are we praying for if his will can't be stopped anyway? When we pray for a different outcome, we're asking God to alter his predetermined perfect plan. What's that about? Matthew 10 tells us, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Even the very hairs of your head are numbered. God took the time to count the hairs on our heads. How involved is he? Nothing happens unless God knows about it and wills it. In that light, unless he's simply powerless to prevent it, he must want this child to have cancer. After all, she's worth more than many sparrows, as we just read in Matthew. And not a sparrow will fall to the ground outside of God's care. Perhaps her affliction is God's will. But wait, God's plan might be this, that we unlock his healing power through our obedient, fervent prayer. That's God's will, right? This brings to light an even more alarming scenario. God has the cure for cancer. However, he holds the solution hostage until he feels the adequate number of petitions have been offered up. He knows it. He owns it. He has the power to use it. Yet he is content to keep his healing hands withdrawn until the desired number of petitions are presented at his feet. Cancer in babies is terrible. But you know what? More terrible is you not sitting at my feet and begging. And we hear the desperate parents beg. If God's will is to do nothing until we plead and beg and plead and beg and plead over and over for the healing of a child, until we send up this specific amount of prayers using a specific portion of faith amidst the offerings and the angst and all the tears, how do we then call God merciful, loving, and just? God is blackmailing us, and he's using our own children to get what he wants. Now, this is often where I hear the fallen world arguments, you know. It's our fault because we're sinners. It's a fallen world. Anybody else heard this one? Makes my head spin. You know, Eve was tempted in the garden, and then it all went to shit. Seeding into all of humanity a sin nature, and this brought about sickness and disease. We sinned. It's our fault. Surely I was sinful at birth. From the time my mother conceived me, I was already full of sin. But let us consider something. God reveals that God himself, in Genesis you can read this, God himself created the serpent that tempted Eve, the giver of temptation that spun into motion the destruction of the world. In fact, all things have been created through him and for him. Ezekiel 28 said God himself created Lucifer. Oh, that's something I'd kind of like a do-over on, don't you? Isaiah says God is the creator of evil. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Why would a good God ever create evil? This information creates a difficult profile of God for Christians to accept. When I was a believer, I would have blocked this one out, but it has to be entertained and examined. If you hold to the God of the Bible, God created Lucifer knowing he would become wicked. God created evil. God introduced Lucifer's influence to humankind. Lucifer's influence produces sin. Sin is responsible for disease. Disease, sin, Lucifer, evil, God. It could be argued pretty convincingly that the cause of cancer is God himself. So we're asking the cause of cancer to cure cancer. We blame ourselves for his invisibility and uninvolvement, and we give God credit for treatments that we self-administer. Many hold to the idea that this earthly life is just a testing ground. It's supposed to be hard and full of suffering. Our suffering's like boot camp, where our pain makes us stronger. See if this looks familiar. I'm not worthy. I am weak, but he is strong. I'm too stupid to decide for myself. He does all the thinking. Pain tests me, and it makes me better. It sharpens me. 
He's jealous and he has a temper, but if you really knew him, you'd see how wonderful he can be. He'll hurt me if I break up with him. He's my everything. I just can't leave him. Now, this could be a conversation that the deferential Christian has about their God and Savior, or it might be that something that an abused partner might say. Mind it not? Oh, if you could only see him on his good days, he's so amazing. And he really does love me. And he only allows Harbin to come to me for my own good. I deserve it. I, it's my fault. It's my fault. I erase my identity because I need to be more like him. John tells us, the Bible says, he must increase. I must decrease. I'm going to try to pray more. I'm going to be better. I need greater faith. We pray for ourselves. We pray for others. We pray for resolution. We pray for peace. We pray for safety. We pray for sunshine. We pray for rain. We pray for touchdowns during the Super Bowl. For a new job, for an A on the test paper, for wisdom, for answers, we pray. It's become something we do to comfort ourselves and others in desperate times. And in some aspects, it really does appear a beautiful gesture, doesn't it? I mean, it gives the surface appearance of humility. I know many of these people grandstanding, praying in public, <laughs> they don't look humble at all. They look like they're shouting God's name and drawing attention unto themselves. But in many ways, it, prayer does give that impression of humility. You know, we're focused outward, not inward. It often connects people. It involves physical touch, a touch of compassion, holding hands, an embrace, a hug, a hand upon the shoulder, a soft tone of voice, and a comforting word. It speaks to our inclination toward rituals. I talked to Dr. Andy Thompson on a recent broadcast about this. It gives us structure, brings us together. It makes us feel good. Prayer on its surface seems beyond criticism, beyond reproach, even if it does nothing else. Hey, hey, it's a tie that binds. And it reassures and comforts someone who's hurting. And that very well may be true. What if comfort's become an excuse to delude ourselves, right? What if comfort has become king? Above truth, above reality, does comfort trump all other considerations? I'm going to play a short video clip. This is from an older episode of uh, Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher back from 2001. The guests include comedian George Carlin and atheist George Carlin, actress Julie Warner, lawyer Robert Shapiro, and congressional aide Horace Cooper. And they were talking about prayer. Check this out. What if it makes people feel better? That's a different thing. That is. You want to exactly. give the universe the name God, that's fine. The universe exists. We are all equal parts of it. But we are don't, made of the same stuff. Are most, that's are, good. Are most, that's religions, religions, most religions are based on the idea that somebody in some way through prayer can yes, make you feel better? Yes, but why do you need to make up stories? Yes, why should why it be a Why does person? the Supreme Being have to be just... Because what? life is hard understand. and you need to make up stories. I don't stories. understand you need yeah. to make... <laughs> because life is hard and you need to make up stories. I think she may have stumbled onto something, right? Life is hard. We develop the coping mechanism to get through, but they're human-made mechanisms. As with the battles to survive cancer, we seem perfectly willing to give prayer and praise to a God that remains invisible and mute. And if it's human beings, if it's us doing all the talking and all the doing and all the coping and all the suffering and all the dying, we should perhaps reevaluate everything we've come to think about prayer. Now, I understand that it's unpopular to have these conversations. Any Big Lebowski fans, I always enjoyed this line. He's like, no, you're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. That's kind of what I occasionally feel like bringing this up, right? But let's ask one more quick question here. What if the act of prayer isn't always positive? What if praying in some circumstances is part of the problem? A decade-long, $2.5 million study was funded by, mostly by the John Templeton Foundation. It involved more than 1,800 hospital patients. The study used people undergoing heart surgery. Three groups. There's a group not prayed for, the group that was prayed for but didn't know about it, and the group that was prayed for and did know about it. All right? There was no discernible difference in the health of all of these people except the patients who knew they were being prayed for actually fared worse. 
They had more complications. And this is possibly, they hypothesize, they, they think it's possibly because of the stress of knowing that they were expected to get better because they knew people were praying for them. So whenever they didn't improve, they were riddled with angst and confusion and grief and pain. Shit, I should be doing much better. Look at all the people praying for me. Pressure, right? How many times had I as a Christian told somebody in need, hey, I'll, I'll pray for you, right? Intending to do absolutely nothing. Was I really helping? How honest was I being, right? How often did I go back to my inner room and pray for this person? <laughs> It's like that meme, I'll pray for you. Translation, I want the best for you as long as it takes no effort on my behalf. It's sure easier to say, you know what, I'll pray for you than to give money to a worthy charity or to go get the tools out of the shed and go help you know, sandbag when there's a flood or to help people in times of need to actually get our hands dirty and do something. No, it's, I pray. it's a way to feel good while doing absolutely nothing. Prayer then becomes a negative. It's a cop out. In many ways, it's a lie. I had a, a relative going through a huge health crisis just a few months ago, right? Diagnosed by a trained physician. They go in and a, a trained physician sees the problem. They end up cutting her open to solve the problem. She recovers with 24-hour bedside medical care. I think she spent a week in the hospital, whatever. She's back home and recovering. You know what her social media page looked like? This. Pray, pray, praying, praise, 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 praise Jesus, praying for you. God does miracles. Glad you're a Pray, pray, blah, 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 blah. And the true healers in this situation completely ignored. I saw all these comments from the God Squad, not one acknowledgement of the doctor. It's like that line, uh, that meme online. Get horribly injured on God's watch. Call 911. Get treated by paramedics before being transported to the hospital. Get invasive surgery, round-the-clock care, prescription medication. Take weeks, months, or years for full or partial recovery and thank God for saving your life. It makes no sense. If prayer worked, there would be no 911. This much is certain. The difference between you, me, and the biblical God, I am sure of it. If you and I had the power to prevent cancer, we'd do it. We'd have done it this morning. We'd have done it the second we, had the, we realized we had the power and the information. We immediately would do it. And without being asked, it would be solved. We could feed the world's hungry. We could stop the next deadly earthquake. We could cure AIDS. We could prevent war, prevent the rape of a child. We would immediately. No question, no hesitation, no games, no lessons, no mysterious ways, no bribery, no conditions, period. We do it. There's a quick reason to think that prayer can, in some cases, produce a tangibly positive effect before I get to my closing remark here. There's a 2013 study conducted by a guy named uh, Professor Malt Fries and Michaela Wang, suggest even non-believers might benefit from prayer, but not in the way you might anticipate. They studied prayer in the context of helping people resist temptation, help me be stronger of will, okay? So they studied prayer in that context. And the prayer group did score higher in terms of willpower, but this shoring up of the mind bears no measurable supernatural content. It instead speaks to a sense of connection and social interaction, which strengthens our resolve. It was the idea of connecting, and this could have been natural or supernatural. It was the idea of connecting to someone else socially that gave us more wherewithal. I recently did a radio show with Dr. Paul Offit. He gave the perspective that prayers for patients often calmed them down. Hey, I buy that. It relaxed them, it relaxed their families, it made them more likely to participate in their treatments because they had a positive mindset, provided a genuine sense of encouragement and hope, and regardless of what many may think after my challenges today, I really am all about encouragement and hope. I simply hold the opinion that we don't have to make up stories in order to provide hope and encouragement. We don't have to surrender our value and blame sin or a devil or accept that cancer and other diseases are our fault because we're just so unworthy. We can kneel at the hospital bed. We can say the words of love and support. We can hug. We can hold. We can kiss. We can lift up. We can encourage. We can fight these battles against malady and misfortune. We can do so in a beautifully human context. We don't have to construct or be constrained by an allegedly divine context. We can live lives that make sense. We can act and speak in ways that make sense. 
And instead of being distracted by what we think might be out there, we can focus our attention, our efforts, and energy on what we can see and touch and hold and keep right here. We can also pledge ourselves to not commit one of the only true sins, for lack of a better word, in times of crisis. Pray all you want. Knock yourself out. But please, please, don't ignore the men and women who every day put themselves out there on the line to help us in our hour of need. The ones on call, day and night, who receive us, who diagnose us, diagnose our problems, who use their decades of training and experience and expertise to help us overcome those problems, who are the guardian angels that actually show up at the scene, who live and work directly in harm's way every single day, who create and provide the medicines which stop the infection and soothe the pain and fight the disease, who stop the bleeding, who remove the tumors, who set the bones, who restart the heart, who implant the pacemaker, who transplant the organ, and who put us back together again. After all, we're not seeing Jesus or any other supernatural agent restoring lost vision. Instead, it is the human healers among us. Jesus isn't causing the deaf to hear. That particular miracle comes from the human healers among us. Jesus isn't causing the lame to walk. They're walking, even running, because of the human healers among us. And if we ever do find a cancer cure, it will be because of the immeasurable efforts of the human healers among us. Perhaps one day, my friends, we will see proof of supernatural healing, and a God somewhere might do something that doesn't mask itself as human effort or the natural processes of a physical world. Somebody will see it, they'll demonstrate it, and they will collect their Nobel Prize. But until then, I hold to the famous quote by Madeleine Murray O'Hare that said this, two hands working can do more than a thousand clasp in prayer. Thank you very, very much for having me out today.